Hello, I'm Scott Hammond from NCI Communications, and I have the pleasure today of welcoming Manfred Ketz de Vries, who is a professor, clinical professor uh, of leadership at uh, NCIAD, as well as being the director of the NCIAD Global Leadership Center. Manfred, welcome. I would like to ask you a few questions about. I won't say your new book, I'll say one of your <laughs> new books because there are several. The particular one I wanted to focus on today is called Coach and Couch, The Psychology of Making uh, Better Leaders. This is a theme that you have dealt with extensively um, in the past, but what is the new uh, element that you're bringing to this particular subject? Uh, basically, it's an attempt of my part to try to capture some knowledge of uh, INSEAD's Global Leadership Center. And it really focuses on particular on one uh, form of intervention, which is group leadership coaching, which has become, I think, uh, at the moment, something like 3,500 executives in all, the, in all the different executive programs are exposed to it in very, from short to long. The, basically, the Rolls Royce of the programs are uh, the one I'm running at actually presently, which is the Challenge of Leadership, aimed at CEO types. And uh, then we have also have a program called Coaching Consulting for Change. So the, the book is really tries to illustrate how to, uh, how to go about coaching interventions, particularly group coaching interventions, and also, I think, another element is how to create a coaching culture in organizations, which I think is quite important. I think you know, the old autocratic leadership style doesn't work that well anymore when you are in knowledge society, and you need another style of leadership, and so how to introduce this kind of coaching culture. And so there are contributions from uh, quite a few people, from uh, talking about instrumentation which can be used, for feedback instrumentation, to uh, talking about uh, how to create better organizations. One of your key themes has been that we should not think of organizations and their leaders necessarily as rational uh, actors, but that uh, we need to look at the emotional side. I guess this is relatively easy to understand when we're talking about people because that we know people uh, have emotions, but when you talk about an organization having, a, having an emotional side, well, what do you mean by that? No, it's more of course, uh, you know, organizations are made up of people, and so, uh, uh, in particular, I mean, the old statement, fish start to smell at the head, is uh, very true. So if, if, you get, if the top management creates a toxic environment, that will have an, you know, an effect on the rest of the organization. Actually, one of the things I try to do in my Challenge of Leadership program is uh, have a fantasy there, which is, of course, men's search for meaning that if I take 20 executives and spend time with them and they together are responsible for 100, 200,000 people, if I make them a little bit more effective and maybe more humane, it might have a positive effect to the organization. So uh, people make organizations, but you know, organizations can create uh, social defenses, which is ways, ways of uh, creating a kind of organizational culture which is not, uh, doesn't foster getting the best out of people. And that's what I try to do, really. I'm always intrigued by you know, the best companies to work for. What can you do to create better organizations? Is it a mark, a good mark of leadership that the, company, the company's corporate uh, culture and emotional uh, atmosphere reflect the leader, or is it uh, a bad thing? No, I mean, it's, uh, I wrote many years ago a book called The Neurotic Organization, in which I try to illustrate that's a relationship in personality, uh, corporate culture, and the kind of decision-making taking place in the organization. Leadership style in Russia is very different from leadership style in Sweden or in Singapore. There are different things, but it's usually a team sport. And I think the, one of the important thing is to look at complementarity. Some person being a strategist, some being a turnaround manager, some person being a good coach, some person being a good communicator. It's the combination which counts. Look, of course, looking at the future. And that's one of the things I, I try to help. So when you, have, when, you, when you work as a coach with a group of people, uh, what happens is that some of the 600-pound gorillas, which are always somewhere there, particularly at the top executive teams, may be discussed and talked about as supposed to be there smelling up the place. Second, we have this term always knowledge management, which is a very nice term, but knowledge management is not building up a database alone. It also means that you have to trust each other. You build trust. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the process, uh, people have a tendency to break down the silos because when you're particularly top management level, people have very silo-oriented behavior. So people start to understand each other better. And, uh, you know, and virtual teams start to work much better. And it's a very simple thing. If you, uh, if you make this kind of intervention, uh, you have constructive conflict resolution, people are more accountable, and people, in the end, you have better results. 
And so that's what I try to do. And it seems to be, I mean, the market has basically been speaking. We have been doing it now for a number of years. And according to the feedback, they find an extremely useful type of intervention. You use a word in the book, which I think you may have invented. I've never seen it before, <laughs> called authentizotic. Yeah. Well, when you say an organization is authentizotic, well, what, what do you mean exactly? I took it from the Greek, to be honest, from two words, authentikos uh, uh, and sotikos. And authentizotic is an organization where you really feel alive. Too many organizations, when I you know, have some gulag qualities. In the, in the past, I used to be the pathologist of organizations. I wrote other depressing books on the erotic organization, organization on the couch, struggling with the demon, all those kinds of things. So I, I got interested, and, and you know, I get depressed, they get depressed, everybody gets depressed. So I got interested over the last years, particularly what can we do to make organizations where people really feel alive and get the best out of people. And so this description of Saint Isotic is an attempt to basically to, as a kind of flag, to show this is the kind of, like the best companies to work for. But basically, I mean, uh, the role of a leader is to get the best out of people, to really make people feel alive and not becoming automatons, which is too often the case. Uh, and that is, I think, a waste of one's life. You have only one life and make it a good, make an interesting journey. You have talked also about one of your categories of leaders, the, the narcissistic uh, leader. Is uh, a narcissistic leader capable of creating an authentizotic organization? Oh my God, that's a loaded question. Uh, now, I mean, uh, let's put it this way. We all need to be somewhat narcissistic. It's, it's good for creativity, leadership, etc. It's the question of uh, the balance. And uh, my, my task is to keep sane people sane and in sane places. Because there's always a combination of disposition, you know, narcissistic disposition, but also the position. And some people cannot handle the position. Because when you are in the position of leadership, people have a tendency to tell you what you want to hear. And it needs a strong individual to stand up to that and try to keep, retain his or her sense of reality. Of course, it's usually men, because men tend to be more narcissistic than women. But you need some narcissism. But if you, of course, if you're a narcissistic personality disorder, we talk about another whole other category. But a certain dose, I mean, it makes for self-esteem and all those kind of things. But you know, I've seen, I must admit, some people who had a moderate narcissistic disposition getting into certain situations where it got to the head. You know, businessmen of the year, et cetera, all those. And suddenly they uh, were like Hitler in the bunker. One of the examples that you um, cite is uh, Jean-Marie Messier of yeah. Vivendi. Yeah. Uh, would you put him in that category? Certainly. I mean, uh, I guess uh, it's actually an interesting thing from going from water purification company to Hollywood. My, it was quite a journey. You have to give him credit for that. But he, it's a question of counterbalance. You know, uh, do you have people who are willing, do you create a culture, and that's coming back to the coaching culture, where people is a give and take, where there's open dialogue, frank dialogue. If you don't have, there's also 360 feedback instruments are so important, with all their biases. But the old statement is, if one person tells you you have ears like a donkey, forget it. But if two people tell you so, get yourself a saddle. So, I mean, there might be some smoke there. And, uh, and I guess he had not enough people who pushed him back and say this. And also, I guess, the non-executive directors, whatever directors there were, failed. Because that's the role, to hire, fire, and monitor senior executives, you know, in particular the CEO. And they failed. But that it's, a, it's really a problem, uh, because usually the non-executive directors bend over backwards before they really take a step and do something about it. We were talking about... Uh uh, organizations in terms of, of companies, but obviously there are lots of other organizations in human society, notably a government, and uh, we have uh, in France today um, a, a rather strong leader who's also been accused of being a, a, a egocentric and narcissistic. Do you think that uh, the current French president, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, uh, is an example of any of the pathologies that you've defined? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, I read, read his uh, testimonial. I read it carefully because, I mean, I'm, I'm affected by what's happening now, like we have now a major strike. And I think, at least in his testimonial, he is eminently sensible. I mean, he, uh, really, for change, after a number of precedents, I felt we just going through the motions, but uh, he's trying to, he wants to do something. And I guess it's interesting to talk about narcissism. I think his father used to say, with that name like yours, can never be anything in France, which is, you know, daring them wrong, which is a very good sign. Yeah, but you, you never know. You, know, you don't know how it develops. I think uh, it is important as a leader 
that you create this kind of culture. At the moment, I, have, I, don't, see the, I don't see any worrisome phenomena. I mean, he's an action-oriented, he's a man of action. He's not a philosopher. I mean, you have people like uh, Mitterrand, who was much more of a philosopher. He's an action man, he wants to get things done. And he says, better, you know, basically, better to be 70% right than do nothing at all. So I want to take a chance. And I give him credit for that, because this country needs, needs to move. It has been stuck too long, and certain things just... It, it, and it's a fantastic country, but uh, certain things have to change. It can, they cannot just be in a kind of isolated you know, entity. You talk a lot uh, in your books about the fact that um, we all have our flaws uh, as people, and leaders uh, are people uh, with their flaws, but that there are tangible, measurable progress that can be made through the coaching process. Could you talk a little bit about how that actually happens? I mean, it's the core of the process. I mean, I run two programs myself, which I think are transformational. I like things with oomph. I give a lot of lectures, but lectures might touch people a little bit, but I, I want to create a tipping point. People usually know what they have to do. They know they're micromanagers. They know they're conflict avoided. They know they're abrasive, but they don't do anything about it because there's also some pleasure in it. This causes pain, but also some pleasure in it. And it is and it's our task, and particularly the, the group process fosters that, to create a tipping point that people don't, don't, don't say to themselves, I should do something, you know, I have a dream, but nothing happens, but to really take action. And that, that's the reason I was just making the comment about Sarkozy, take action. And so uh, I have seen some very significant change taking place. If you really push people in the right direction, and take some time. The programs I run myself are not short. I mean, both programs are here, and people learn something, go back home to the office, practice it or not practice it, they come back again. And I say always, I say always, I work on shame, guilt, and hope, which sounds terrible. The hope for a new future, and shame and guilt, because I'm like a bad penny. I said, three months later, you see me again, and what have you done? Because I ask people to have an action plan, I take those steps in the group setting. And that's, so the group, the group dynamics are very strong in pushing people in the direction, because they don't want to let the other members of the group down. So this is especially, I'm not saying that one-to-one -one coaching doesn't work. Uh, I mean, probably 80% of coaching in the world is one-to-one. -one. But I think the intervention technique we use at INSEAD is second to none. I think we are very hard to beat. And we have, I uh, guess, thanks to also our coaching and consulting program, we have developed a group, a team of very good coaches. I mean, I know it. I mean, the buck stops me and I get all these kind of ratings, which I look at. Even that's you know, my only a minor reflection of their talent, but uh, we do a pretty good job, I think. Manfred, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us today. Anyone interested in learning more about Manfred's books as well as the uh, INSEAD Global Leadership Center, please go to our website, nsead.edu. Thank you very much.